what's up hybrids welcome back to another episode of the phantom hybrid podcast i am here with anthony laurie and mike and we are discussing shadow and bone episode seven this is the penultimate episode for season one so let's get into it because woo woo (laughs) so we start out this seventh episode with some backstory on Kierigan. And I wondered when we would get it because we kept saying there's got to be more to his story. There's got to be more to his story. So we do find out a little bit more of his background. And this takes place maybe a couple of hundred years ago. There seemed to be a conflict with the king that Kierigan was serving at the time. Something that Kierigan did, and I don't think they ever expressly said what it was, But there was something that he did for the king that allowed the king to win the current war that they were fighting. But it also put the Grisha on the king's radar. And at this point, when we start out the seventh episode, Kerrigan is basically fleeing for his life. And he comes to a little cottage that's in the woods. There's a healer there named Luda. And this is apparently the person that he loves, his girlfriend or whatever you want to call it um, back then. So of course, immediately I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, they're about to make us feel sorry for him. And they're about to give us our why for why he's doing what he's doing in terms of Alina and trying to, you know, find the stag and all this other stuff. So I was looking at this kind of reluctantly. I was like, I don't want to feel sorry for him. You know, it, it didn't make me sympathetic. In fact, it, it just made me sad because old girl was like, I'll die for you. Like, whatever, fine. Ugh. And the thing is, I don't think she was... So basically, they were getting ready to leave. They were packing. Um, you know, Bagra had taken the other Grisha to hiding. And the king sent his men after them. And they basically were attacking... Alexander they were shooting him with arrows and as he was taking the arrows out Luda was in the cottage healing him and of course one of the king's men came around the back of the cottage and found her on the inside brought her out and was like okay here's the witch that's been healing him every time that we hurt him and Kerrigan at this point starts to plead he's like look if the king wants me he has to take us both I'll go quietly just don't do anything to her and of course you know how men in power have to be. They they have to be the assholes and be like, oh no, that's not what we were told. And so they stabbed Luda. And, and I mean, the way that they killed her, they stabbed her and they made sure they twisted that knife so that it was a fatal blow. And I was like, so you mortal men that have no powers, you're going to kill this man's loved one in front of him and you think because he's got shackles on that this is going to save you y'all ain't i mean it's like okay the whole thing like because i'm watching it now it's like the first part where they shoot him and he pulls the arrows out if i was them and i i just shot you through the chest with an arrow and you pull the damn with two arrows and pull the you pull the out I'm not going to shoot you again because obviously the first time it didn't fucking work. Like, you got to figure something else out. Like, I don't. Well, like, well no. not, not only that, what, what Luda says to him before they got they came in, she says, I can live another hundred years, possibly with an amplifier, which is a foreshadowing. And he says, mm-hmm. but you're just mortal. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but that would have been an indication that maybe old boy is not necessarily on my side 100% because if he was really in love with her, he would have agreed with her and said, well, something along the lines of, well, you know what? We'll see what we can do. Maybe that's something we can visit later. He just sort of dismissed it and said, well, you're just mortal. I'm okay. Well, no, no, no. Okay. You've got it backwards because he said something to her about being okay. mortal got it, first. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, and it was more like you're mortal because right, she was right, talking okay. about them Sending right. people to look for them and they could hide and she was like well mm-hmm. we can hide from them and he looks at her and he grabs her face he's mm-hmm. like but you're just mortal now so apparently whatever was going on with her or as a grisha she's i guess she was supposed to be immortal at some point and now she's not but she still has her powers and then that's when she says but i could live for a hundred years with an amplifier and he says 
what does he say? Long I know that must seem you. like right. a long time. Well, yeah. So I think I think there was there was something going on, and we'll probably find out more about this in the second season because right. we don't really get anything else in this episode. But he seemed genuine about right. his feelings for her. And then, of course, you know, like we find out later on when he's talking to Bagra, you know, she's kind of dismissive about the way he's feeling about the fact that Luda has died because she was like, she's just like all the others. I told you not to worry about them. You need to worry about yourself because in Bagra's mind, you're immortal. You need to stop worrying about these mortal chicks because all you're going to do is love them you're going to lose them and it's just going to continue on just leave them alone and worry about staying alive that's kind of what and i get that but i think that the reason because the 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 guy that she mentioned i think what and i don't know anything i'm just speculating i think that the issue is is that some of the grisha some of the ones who are less powered burn through their small science power or manipulation and mm-hmm. they may start off having some sort of immunity or whatever, or immortality, but as they get older, it seems like they possibly burn through whatever protection they had. So she's at the age where she looks fairly youngish, but she's probably being a healer since she was a baby. So by the time she can say, let's, let's call it 30, by the time she's 30, mm-hmm. she already can see because she's a healer how long her life is going to be. And she can see that she's already burning out because of the small sciences, mm. because again, this is not magic. This is what they call small science, which I hope they'll get in more into the sex second season, because to me, it's either magic or it's not. And to say it's a science, you need to give me some background, which we didn't get. Yeah, I think that's It is interesting that Bagra thing. says, we practice small science, not magic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. and I think what he wanted to do, what he probably ended up doing was maybe magic. And that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's like, we don't, we don't do that because that's dangerous. It uses you. Yeah. Cause if you think about it, so after they kill Luda, you know, the guy, he's still sitting there taunting him. He walks up to Alexander. He's like, do you still have a message for the king? And Alexander's like, yes. He breaks apart the tree limb that's holding his hands together in the back. He breaks it apart and he, kind of does this motion with his arms where he brings his arms together in a circle. And as he does this, the shadow part of his magic goes through and it literally beheads all of the king's men in front of him. And when I saw that, I was like, oh. They should have known better. I have an observation. Is that theory? No, was that your theory? Yeah, what? observation. Observation. You said he had an observation stop, Mike. It's too early. We're We're literally five minutes in. It's too early for any theories. Come on now. (laughs) Um, how I just wanted to point out how convenient that they were all the same height. <laughs> oh, jeez, <laughs> that's a good point. I don't even think that would matter. He could have taken off some shoulders, he or he, or he could have just off, take like, a little bit off the top, you know, just give him a little trim, like you know, like a, like if, if one of them had an afro, they'd have a flat top now. Like, just somebody like, should be like half beheaded, like half their head with the makeup off. I mean, it's possible. We we didn't really see, I, I, but I actually, did, the heads I actually did actually the freeze, freeze frame. I thought I saw his head. What? I'm sorry. What? Oh, what? Did. I did. I'm sorry. What, what was that? It wasn't any connection oh to any goodness. theory. It was just how convenient they were all the same. <laughs> I thought I thought you said you weren't doing any of that anymore. <laughs> In connection to theories, no. Um. Yeah, I was going to say, because I think he went back on that with the Loki episode where yeah. we were trying to count how that's many true. reset yeah, charges. Yeah. Still I mean, if we're being honest, else. he's been giving theories all along. He's just been calling no, them suppositions. No, and... no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 just no. <laughs> oh, so, so after... Alexander beheads all of the king's men, and I'm sure there's a humpty yep. dumpty. Not putting them here. together again. <laughs> he takes Luda's body and he goes to this sanctuary that Bagra has taken all of the other Grisha. And, you know, he's looking for someone to heal her. And um, one of the Grisha says, The closest thing we have is a tailor. We were waiting for Luda, and then he lays Luda down on the settee, and they're all looking like, Oh shit, I guess we don't have a healer anymore. <laughs> So he goes to find his mother, Bagra, and Bagra is in bed. She seems like she's kind of sick or she's weak. 
I mean, they have a conversation and it's so weird. You know, the relationship between Bagra and Alexander is so weird because on the one hand, she almost seems like a loving, concerned mother and he seems like a devoted son. And then almost in the next breath, they're kind of going at it with each other. You know, she's accusing him of putting the Grisha on the king's radar and Alexander's upset. And she's asking, where's your girl? And he's like, she's dead. She died because of me. And Bagra says, she died because of what you are. They always die. They're not as strong as you and me. And that, you know, we talk about Alexander, his power and the fact that he's immortal. And we don't think about the fact that, okay, so Bagra obviously is the same mm-hmm. way because right. she's his mother. They've both been alive for hundreds of years. So I'm really specifically interested in what it is about those two that make it's, them so it's powerful. their power. Because I don't think their, anybody it's else... Their, it's their ability to wield mm-hmm. the shadow. But my question is, why are they the only ones to do it? Like, what is it in their background? Like, are they descended from whoever the first Grisha are or... I just yeah, I, like... I have no theory for that. Sorry, but but to your point <laughs> about how she treats him, it's, uh, the, there was a show we were doing that got canceled, cursed, and how Uther's mother treated him, and right, he, sort of like mm-hmm. Bagra is looking at him as both her son and the leader of the Grisha. So, like some of the things she mm-hmm. says to him is like, "This is what I'm going to tell my son." But if you're going to be the leader, this is how you have to be. So it, there's there it, right. it's going to be right. it's going to feel like two different things because she has to treat him like two different right. things. Right. Just like when he tells her, he's like, her blood is on your hands as much as it is on mine. You're the one who taught me how to kill. She said, I taught you how to kill so that you could protect yourself. She was like, I didn't teach you to yeah, kill. And then to, to he, she said, him. you went off and you won the war for the king. <laughs> and now he's coming after you. I told I told you that was a bad right. idea. Because what, what do powerful men like right. that do? If, if they see a threat, they want to remove that threat. And he used right. him to win whatever war right. he was in. Saw how powerful he was like, okay, I can't have this dude walking around. Exactly. And oh, right. there's more like him? Oh yes, we have to eliminate all of them, which is usually yeah. He's basically a goes. weapon. I mean, it's just like I mean, I would almost mm-hmm. put it like he's kind of like a guard dog, like and he's really good at his job. I mean, like you said, it's smart. Like you don't want someone who can potentially take your place, even though they don't fully realize it yet. You don't want them to realize that they have that power. And it's because as soon as they realize they have that kind of power where they could take your place, then they'll be like, why are you there? So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really take doesn't really take power to lead. It takes a sharp mind to recognize threats and to eliminate them. And to the other thing you said, you mentioned yeah. about their power is her warning about using magic. It makes me wonder, like, could one of their ancestors have used like black magic? Because you know, we, we're talking about magic here. Like, it, it, I mean, he it, had to find, yeah, he yeah, had it to seems like maybe they are descendants of a person who was practicing black magic, which, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. th- which would explain why they're the only ones why she warned about using magic. Like, we don't use it because he uses us. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And then the, the person he mentioned later, who was it, Mark? Marsakova or Marsova, yeah. That I, I, if I remember, I think that might be maybe one of their ancestors. I think it's Bagra's father. I okay. Think. Well, I, I think okay. one of the things is because of how the the hero worship has evolved. They call them saints, so it's it's possible that there was a group of people who were either immortal or darn near immortal who were quote unquote godlike and as the Grisha have gotten less powerful throughout the ages they're easier to kill with modern technology you can also uh, argue that the original people they've diluted themselves down by uh, 
having children with non-Grisha or lesser power Grisha that they powered themselves down. So it's entirely possible that the original Grisha were either godlike or darn near godlike, and they've just sort of dumped themselves down more than uh, that it has been because the war that he fought for the king, the king asked him to uh, to do this. And what happened is that I believe that the king, like most rulers, got scared. And like Anthony said, you know, you have a weapon that you no longer can control, so you want to take out that weapon. So I think that it was a combination of them having these extraordinary powers, them being long-lived, sort of like elves, and like elves, the longer that they live, the more they're around humans, the more they lose their uh, abilities. And, and didn't, um, and another thing Bagger said was, and she's like, you know, you want to teach them how to fight. They don't, they're not fighters. You know, most of them are, are, right. are they make them. things. They think things. they fix and build things. Yeah. They yeah. make things and they fix things. Yeah. Because that's when she's advising him, go north, go to Kirch. Come back after the king dies at with a nobleman's name. Wait until there's a problem that only the Grisha can fix and then return. That way will be valuable to them. And that's when he says, what about the Grisha that's here now? We need to fight. And basically that's his thing. He wants to protect all the Grisha that's there now. And Bagra says they aren't fighters. These are people who build things. These are people who fix things. And that's when Alexander says, then we make an army. Morozova did it. And then that's what he says, forge new life to Amazon. Since they're his bloodline and he made us too. And she calls it the Merzost is right. the power that right. he. Right. The, yeah, the Merzost. That's the, yeah. the black magic. And that's what she says. We practice a small science, not black magic or not magic. And he says his journals are here. We could do it. And she's like, no, you can't control it. And she's like, he's like, yeah, I can, just like he did. And then she says, then you will die like he did. But of course, we see that that didn't happen. But what happens is the king sends more men, which you saw what happened to the first mm -hmm. set of men you sent. And that was against one person. Why would you send more? I mean, do you really think in this, in this instance, more men are going to come out with a better outcome? No. They come out. Alexander comes out to meet them and they're mm. basically about to attack. They're like, yeah, we're going to kill all of you. Alexander's like, yeah. Well, the, the problem That's is the king wants him alive. Right. But the soldiers are not all that concerned, it seems like, with, with bringing him in alive. Even that first group of soldiers... What was it that he said? He said, the king wants you brought back alive, but maybe that's not what happened. Maybe, what did he say? Maybe you attacked us. And that's when he started having his guys shoot him with arrows because he was going to go ahead and kill them and say, well, you know, I know that you wanted him alive, but he attacked us. We had no choice in that kind of BS that they tend to do. So they tried again with this one. And Alexander... Instead of killing them outright, he he seems to draw this power and he has this, well, he has this explosion <laughs> of power, I guess. And we see all this black shadow comes out. And this is where we find out that Alexander is the one who actually created the fold. He is dun, dun, dun. the black heretic, not his ancestor. I mean, we got we him. kind we kind yeah, of figured so that out. As soon as they, as soon as Bagra said that he was older than he really put on, it's a short walk to say that since he's older, that it's, it was probably him that ended up creating the fold. So I mean, yeah, because like, like, it's like they, it made it seem like he was maybe a couple hundred years old, but then someone said, "Well, the fold has been around for four hundred years." So then he's like, he's mm -hmm. even older than that. Yeah. In the background. Yeah. Yeah, he he yeah, he in the book it says that he's lived several lifetimes. Uh, and and I was like, "Oh, okay." But my my thing is is that I I question uh the the use of the uh, dark magic, black magic and call, you know, thing because I think that it could be a magic spell that he was using, but at the same time, it could be a scientific formula. We just don't know. I mean, hopefully second season they'll let us know, but 
it could be any number of things, you know? I mean, but I wasn't surprised, but it was awesome the way that they did it because I've seen a lot of, you know, reveal of, of things in TV shows, but this one was pretty good, even though we knew it was coming. Yeah, th- and this whole, this, yeah, the whole scene, was- like I'm watching it where he, where he says, submit to me, and the darkness goes out from him and everybody hits their knee immediately. And then, mm-hmm. then, then he mm-hmm. let, then he lets the bog out of out, out of him. It's like, I mean, I gotta give it to, I gotta give give it to people who are making, who are making shows like this, like the, all the Marvel shows. This show, it's like the the amount that they spend on effects and how they mm-hmm. execute them mm-hmm. is remarkable. Like just oh, yeah. sort of remarkable. Oh, yeah. Like I mean, just the scale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Just. Yeah, because I'm watching it now where he's walking down and they're saying you'll kill everyone and just the gargoyles on each side of the of the doorway and he's walking down the vines. I mean, it's beautiful. It really is. It's Lord of the Rings quality. That's how beautiful it is. Yeah. But after he creates the foe, we see him running through the woods <laughs> with Bagra. And when he puts he sets her down, you know, she's looking at him like again in that motherly way. She caresses his face, he caresses hers, and you know, she's like, Okay, we're safe. And then she looks up and she's like, What did you do? And of course, you see like the full fold for the first time. And he turns around, he looks and he's like, I made something. I was like, he sounds like a little <laughs> kindergarten kid bragging to his mommy, like, Mommy, oh, man, I did I this. Look what I did. Brutal. But what you made. I'm saying that that's no macaroni sculpture. Yeah. Well, you t- she told him we uh-huh. make things. Not at all. So he made something. I actually had a Voldemort Harry Potter moment watching that scene. I I did, man. <laughs> I was like, hey, there's Lord Voldemort right there, you know? <laughs> it just with the horror cruxes. I was like, hey, look at that. You know, because she she knew when she saw it that you know, it, on one hand, she's like, huh, okay. On the other hand, horrified because now it's like he can't come back. Whatever goodness he had in him is now gone. You know, he's Mm -hmm. literally gone on the dark side. Yep. I mean, you know, you have people who are trying to hunt you down. They've killed your girl. They trying to kill the rest of your I mean, technically, he did create a problem that only Grisha could solve. So, right. This is true. Eh, eh. And correct me, and I, I, this is I, this is me having a small theory. I have a theory. Oh shit! Here we go. Technically, <laughs> since he created the problem, and he is a dark lord, darkling magically, technically, shouldn't he be able to reverse that on his own without having the sun summoner's help? Because he is the creator of the spell. Not necessarily. Mm. Not necessarily. I mean, the thing is, is like mm-hmm. I'm surprised that this wasn't thought of before. Is that since he's a shadow Grisha? Like they didn't think that there was a way that he could was it was I don't know if it was in the books because I've read the books like get like didn't they think that maybe he could control the creatures or maybe he he just kind of hid the fact that he created I mean there's no way that anybody I mean he's around long enough where nobody in their right mind would think that he created the fold like see I've only read Six of Crows I haven't read the actual Shadow Moon so I have no idea I would think that they would think that. Since he was a shadow creature, maybe he could he could control the Volcra or or repel them, or maybe he could, like subdue them to a state where they could actually cross safely, and they wouldn't need a sun summoner. I was just, that was that that's kind of where I was. I, I, I was at the point where number one, he doesn't want to do that. He wants okay. this. Right. No, I understand that. He, he wants this. I think in the way it was created, I think the only way because. He probably can move it around and he can control the creatures inside. But if he were to try to make it smaller, he would have to take it all back in. Like he can manipulate it and make it bigger. Mm, but okay. he if, to make it smaller, he would be reversing it. And he, he can maybe expand it, but he he wouldn't want to reverse it. That's not what he wants to do. Because to reverse it, it would make it go away. If he could even do that, I mean, even if he does like the Moses thing and parts it like a little bit, like you know, that's what he like, makes the sense. I mean, maybe he tried it. Like people were like, "Oh, you control shadows? Maybe you could control the phone." Maybe he was like, maybe he made a show up going in front of it, like, "Oh, I can't do it." 
No. Okay, I really can't do it. He could have said, whoever did this was way more powerful than I was, and I can't undo Like, it. yeah, he must have been really powerful and handsome, and, you know, just, like, <laughs> he knows his shit. Yeah, like, he's really good. This guy, the guy who did this is just incredible. Like, I don't think you could even defeat him if he was standing in front of you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah at this point, I don't think he would have tried to get rid of it, even if he could, because there's still that divide right now between the regular people and the Grisha and the Grisha are still treated kind of like second class citizens. And I think he would wait until things are a little bit more like it would have to get to that tipping point. And then he would be able to come in and do what he wants to do, get rid of it and then show his true power and be like, okay, so now that we see that I can do this, let me tell y'all how this is going to work. And that's when he would take over everything and put the Grisha pretty much at the top of the food chain. And I don't think he feels like they're at that point at this moment yet. Right. Yeah. And and he spent right. so much time telling people what he can't do. So he has a sun summoner to make the tunnel and part the Red Sea for him. Because if he were to do it, then they can look at him like, oh, you could have done this this whole time. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. they would have all turned on him. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Yes, it's kind of like he's going to be using Alina as Mm -hmm. a smoke screen. You know, hey, yeah, I can't really do all this, but this person can. And then that way people will kind of like she said, if this thing fails, if she's not able to get rid of the fold, Alina feels like people will blame her. You know, she'll become the next pariah. If that happens, then all of that is on her and he's still Mm, kind mm. of safe in that sense you know and then later on if he wants to show the full force of his power take over unseat the king then he'll still be able to do that but I, i think at this point he's still kind of like yeah let's not let everybody know just how powerful i am which will play into a lot of things that he does later on I, I, you know, right. yeah, I, I agree with that. I just, it's just, what's that? It's a shell game. He's moving pieces back and forth to uh, best give him the best uh, uh, view from people and the best advantage. Right. But after we see that, we cut into present day. And of course, he's in the woods. He's looking for Alina and Mal. And he's looking for the stag. And then we... Move the scene over to our favorite (laughs) outcasts, the crows. This scene was so funny because, of course, Inej got hurt during their last encounter because they were fighting some of the Grisha and she got stabbed. So she's still having some issues because her wound is not healing on its own. So she has to sew herself up. And when I tell you, it's so funny looking at Poor Jesper, this guy. Greenish about this wound. I'm like, just you shoot people. You can shoot people. Like, you can't take a little cut. Well, even though it's not a cut, that was a pretty deep gash. That's a wound, yeah. But still, yeah. I mean, but, you know, shout out to the gratuitous belly nudity that they show up in this and like, you know, like they're, they're trapping Anthony. I'm sorry, dude. No. No. No, really. Oh, just Anthony? No, we are in, <laughs> we are in this together, bruh. Okay, yeah, you okay, okay, I can't I can't lie, we are in this together. I was like, okay, really guys? Like y'all y'all thirst trapping us. We're already into the into the series. You ain't gotta do all that. Like, you know, she's an interesting character without showing her outstanding abs and her and her sewing ability, which when she was like doing her stitches and poor poor Jesper was just about to lose everything. I mean, it was just that that, that I, I agree with you. That was just fucking hilarious. <laughs> The look on his face, he's looking like, oh, do I have to watch this? Oh, but yeah, so she's sitting there, she's stitching herself up. Kaz also looks a bit uncomfortable watching her sew herself up, but you know, he, of course, he has to be a little brusque about it. He's like, okay, so how, how long before you can travel? And she was like, um, I'm kind of wounded here. Like, why? What's the hurry? He's like, uh, she's like, into where? And he's like, Ketterdam, I think it's time we cut our losses and leave. And both she and Jesper are looking at him like, the fuck? And she tells Jesper, she's like, look, I can't go back. She can't go back to the 
you know, menagerie. Yeah. And Jesper's like, you know, I don't think he'd ever let you go back, but I can't tell you what to do with your shot at freedom. And they're basically having this discussion. She's like, she wants to make a break for it because as she says, she can't go back. And Jesper is making it a little bit emotionally hard for her, as she says. She's like, you're making this harder. He was like, I know, I'd miss me too. <laughs> <laughs> and all the while he's joking, he still has this look on his face like, oh my God, I'm talking to you while you're sewing yourself up. He's just so uncomfortable, that poor thing. Oh, but then we get Elena and Mal and they are in the woods, shivering. They're cold, it's snowing. They are still looking for the stag. And that's when um, Elena tells... <laughs> You know, we get a little humor with them too, but she tells him, she's like, hey, Mal, when we find the stag, I have to be the one to kill it. Because again, she thinks that by killing the stag, she is able to get its amplification powers and then she'll be able to use it against Kerrigan or at least to keep him from getting it. And Mal has to, you know, inject a little humor. He's like, you're a horrible shot. That's why you're I'm just going to say this. <laughs> Instruction manual. I'm done. You need an instruction. You need when you're going to find the mythical beast to do something magical. Instruction guide. That's what I'm saying. Well, I think she was more consumed with running for her life, especially since Bagra pretty much snatched her from what was about to be her love making session with Kerrigan and you know, told her, hey, he's not who you think it is. You need to get out of here because he's using you. I don't think she was, I mean, think about it. She left I'm without sorry. taking anything. I'm sorry. I would have and taken the five minutes to track that. down a scribe, a priest, whoever and say, yo, can I have the instruction guy? <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know. I know. All of those people are, for, are his but seriously, if, if there was ever a need for the instruction guy, user manual, it was with her. But no, because if you think about it, think about know, what I happened know. in the episode. She, they find the stag. The stag literally approaches them. She gets ready to shoot it. And then she realizes, wait, this is not what I'm supposed to do. Like, when it comes to those types of things, she doesn't need an instruction manual because it's literally the, the yeah, way that these true. types of things work if this is her destiny, it's kind of like one of those things where instinct takes over and she knows what she's supposed to do. Unfortunately, that gets messed up because just as they are in this with the stag and she's approaching the stag and it seems like the stag is, I won't say it's, I, I, no, I will say this. It's almost seemed like the stag was kind of. I'll give you that. Her, I'll give you that. If you will, yeah, right, yeah. You know, like, and, and, and it was a gorgeous scene, it, right? And it it was a gorgeous, gorgeous scene. Okay, so maybe and an aftercare guide. How about she, that? <laughs> <laughs> maybe an aftercare uh -huh. guide. Well. He only needed an aftercare guy because Kerrigan showed up and fucked okay, some so, shit up. That's okay, so maybe I called instruction that. manual maybe a couple scenes early. Yeah, no, maybe. I just okay, but, okay. Look, first, okay, first of all, I I remember when we first saw Alina and Kerrigan getting together. I terribly noted that I liked Alina and Kerrigan as a couple. Mm -hmm. and, and uh -huh, and uh -huh. and I and I retracted that. Mm -hmm. I re I did retract that statement, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I really it, it doesn't change my opinion that I that Mal and Alina are just really bad and awkward together. Like I feel like I feel like Mal is like forever in the friend zone, and it's like it's like a, a weird awkwardness between them. Like even when he had he had like the blanket around them, and they were huddled up together. It's like you look at you, you if you look at them, you're like, nah, man, he ain't he ain't getting it. No, they're not together. Like, there's nothing there. Like you just it just doesn't seem see, like I look at that so differently because I feel like there is still something between them. But of course, like I said when we discussed the last episode, this is not necessarily the time to discuss the fact that you guys have feelings for each other 
that have been unspoken y'all kind of got more important things to deal with right now. yeah but if but if, I mean, if that's the whole thing being awkward because they both care about each other and right now they can't do anything about it like she's literally fleeing for her life and he's trying to protect her and keep her safe when is that ever this when does that ever stop anybody who, 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 who was going to be together in anything when has that ever stopped anybody they're they're playing it smart and and here's the thing yeah it, it may not have stopped anybody else in other um in other shows and other stories but how well does that work out for them it usually does in the end it does except for with a lot of trauma in the end it does but what kind of trauma and mess do they have to go through to get to that point oh. Right now, these two, they're not dealing with that because they're focused on the more important thing, which is to keep Kerrigan from getting this amplifier. Okay. But they have, I, I have to say, they have their priorities straight. Okay, but they have their priorities straight, but it still doesn't work out for them in this situation. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't express their feelings for each other, and Alina ends up with stag, with stag horns in her chest. She ends up with staghorns in their chest because Kerrigan comes in and literally shoots. They, they, I mean, they attack Mal. They attack her. He damn near kills Mal. I mean, again, not the right time. Okay, I, I can agree with that. But even even up toward, even up towards the end of, even up towards the end of the episode or the end of episode eight when we're going to the end of the um going to the end of the season nothing that happens between this moment and the end of the show there's literally no time for them to go into that because this is this is not one of those situations where you just declare oh i love you i love you and then just keep going no this is something this is this is something that warrants a conversation this is not something that you declare on the fly or declare just because you think your life is about to end or something like that you don't if it's somebody that you truly care about that you really are in love with you don't do those kind of on the fly declarations and I really feel that's one of the things I do like about the Mal and Alina relationship is because right now they know that their friendship above all is more important. Them staying alive and making sure that Kerrigan doesn't pretty much find a way to rule the whole country, that's more important. Whatever is between them, if it's strong enough, it'll survive whatever they have to deal with now. But right now they have priorities and this is what the priority okay, is. Okay, I can, I can give you that. But also it shout to be. Mal because... As my as this, as I say, Mal stays hurt. I don't understand how he's still alive because he's lost so much blood in these last two or three episodes. Like, I mean, he gets got shot with an arrow, and it's like, I'm um, shout out to Alina for like breaking the arrow off and then pulling it through him. I was like, damn, like, That's are you sure you're not a combat feel, medic? Feel, feel right, she's straight like a devil doctor or combat medic or something because she like. Yeah. I mean, but he stays hurt. I mean, think about it. She she took care of Mal for so many years. Mal was always bullied when they were in the orphanage. So she probably knows how to patch up a wound or two. But, you know, we've had this discussion in the last couple of episodes. I really think Mal might be Grecian, just don't know it. There's something I feel like different that too, yeah. about Mal. The fact that he can hear, the fact that, like he said, when Kerrigan exposed her power in the tent, he was actually able to hear it. He was like, I heard a high pitch sound. When he approached the stack, he said he, he heard the same sound. There's something different about Mal. And I think that might be one of the reasons why they are also drawn to each other as well. But I, yeah, how, I don't think Mal is this? just regular. How thing. about we find out, and I don't know anything, just speculation theory. Mal is a natural amplifier. You know, I wouldn't be or maybe he's I, a I different mean, kind of part render, like well, instead yeah, of hearing okay, heartbeat, all right, okay, he, he can do power. like something right, different. yeah, like maybe, maybe he's like an energy render, like he hears like different levels of like, there, there, right? 
because there there's variations and we don't know what type of Grisha Jesper is yet. We know he's a fixer, but we don't know what type. Yeah, because right. we think he's a Grisha yeah. too. So yeah. 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 But I mean, cause yeah. That actually would make sense, but I mean, because there's there's got to be the variations thing. of these powers. It just can't be fixer, squalor, this, this. There has to be offshoots naturally occurring right. throughout time. I'm just saying, yeah. right? But I mean, here here's the thing. So you you talk about the fact that Mal is almost always hurt, but here's the other thing too. Mal, like I said, and I've said this before, Mal is fucking ride or I die. Can. Because when Alina, when, when Killigan and his crew, they get there, first of all, they shoot the stag. You, uh, oh. They shoot the stag. They kind of knock her out. And then Mal gets ready to kill the stag because they shoot the stag. So the stag is there in pain. He's trying to put it out his misery, but also he's trying to keep Kirigan from getting it. And then here comes Zoya from the back and she uh, distracts him or knocks the bowl from where it's supposed to go. And she's like, that animal's not meant for you. Mal turns around and he's about to go fight her. She is Grisha. He don't care. Mal is not, mm -mm. but he don't care. He's like, no, I'm telling y'all, Mal is the one you want on your side when some shit is about to go down. <laughs> as long as he ain't hurt. And then, <laughs> yeah, and, and, that, and that's that's asking a lot because he, he's, he's hurt. always been hurt. Even when he's hurt. Because they he he right now has an arrow through him. He's still trying to get up. He's still trying to get up. Mal is you have a real good point there because he he he's down. the he's Tell the me. exact definition of ride or die. Like anyone you want mm -hmm. on your side is mm -hmm. someone like that who is like even if they're shot or leg or bones are broken, like they're still like crawling and trying to help you. So yes, you you have you have an excellent point there. Think about it. When Mikhail and Dubrov were getting killed, yeah. he had been shot several times. He still got up and tried to help them. And then he got up and walked his mm -hmm. ass back to camp. Gunshots and well, all. Mal, that ride or die. Well, be on my side. Well, Mal reminds me of the of the Ann, the Ann Bishop Dark Jewels uh, series where they're fighting so hard that they actually transition and die and still keep fighting because they don't realize they're dead. That's literally uh, that's I mean, literally what this reminds me of. He he yeah. seems to me like he yeah. would be that yeah. But then here comes Kirigan. Mm. And he sees them, he sees them too. And he tries to he tries to draw the power from the stag. And Alina goes towards the stag and she she puts up a shield. <sighs> that poor girl, because she's doing whatever she can. Like the stag is sitting there whimpering. She's trying to save the stag mal is hurt and kirigan basically gives her an ultimatum he was like look you got the power of light but you can't heal he was like you can either save the stag or you can save your tracker i can i can save the tracker but you have to give me the stag and that's like one hell of a position to put her in because you're making her choose and mal is telling her no no, you have to do, you know, you have to go for the bigger picture. You have to kill the stag. And Mal is, I mean, again, Mal has been shot. He is crawling towards her like, no, you have to kill it. You have to kill it. Basically telling her, don't worry about me. He's trying to give her the knife so she can kill it. But she makes her decision. She lets the shield down and she goes to Mal. And instead of grabbing the knife, she like covers him and tries to protect him. And of course, here comes Kirigan's guys. They grab her. They pull her away from Mal. They kind of, I think one of them kicks Mal, which I'm like, you are such an asshole. He's already down. He's dying. Why you have to kick him? And then Kirigan, he does the same thing to the stag that he did to the um, Druskella that attacked Alina. He shoots this shadow blade whatever you want to call towards it man and he beheads what is it with beheading in this series like you're beheading everything he's headstrong he the stag oh the see that's just wrong. <laughs> you know i'm about to mute you for the right no. <laughs> now 
but he beheads the stag the antlers are off and i mean he he kills it and then of course he tells them to bring him its antlers and he tells elena you know i'm a man of my word he tells the healers to heal mal but of course they have to go with kerrigan and it's just this whole thing just starts off like this really so i didn't like kerrigan before after this episode i was like you can die a horrible death and i would not be mad love ben barnes love him the the kerrigan represents everything wrong with the white male patriarchy. patriarchy. Oh, yes. God. Yes. Oh, God. I'm so glad that came I back. I'm so happy right now. It. That's what I'm talking I about. Yes. And that, that is a part of it. The white Romeo people. Pimp. I had to get in. I had to get in. I don't even know if Romeo Pimp is a good description because that's even... <laughs> he like, had her. He had her. He's like, do you trust me? It'll be okay. Don't worry. This will help both of us. You and me. Next thing you know. What? What's going on? She's okay. It's okay. Next thing you know. You know what? I can, horns exactly. He's like, I can, I I can help you, baby. You it's for me, baby. Because you have to trust I know, me. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, it's, it's, it's like a fantasy version of the Mac. This is awesome. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, up until they actually did it, he was like, "It's okay, don't worry, boo. I got you." I'm seriously, it was. Uh, I mean, that's I'm like the, the worst body mob like, ever. For real, I'm sur- I'm surprised we're not seeing people pop up with like st- like oh stag horns on their chest. Like, oh my God. I really want to go to Dragon Con now because I want to see how many people actually do that. I'm sure it's gonna happen. Oh, it'll be, but no, oh, that, that sure had to hurt. Sure that ha- and she didn't pass out, bro. That had to hurt. Seriously, I mean, the, but the fact that yeah, let's see, you may not say it's a Romeo Pimp, but I think Mike's right. I think the Mac is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, trust me, baby. But I mean, it's just, and he's still trying to talk to her. He's like, look, we can do. He was like, do you know what's stronger than you or me, us together? Like, you're still appealing to her that, okay, if we're together, we can do anything. We can See, if, that, if, that ain't, if that's like, not some pimp shit, I don't gold. know what it is. Like, <laughs> exactly. like, for real. And he's like, we can do anything. But you didn't answer my question. I didn't answer. Are it's you and me together against the world, baby. Don't you trust me, baby? We can do it I together. Did I not did I not tell you from episode two? That's what he was doing. <laughs> oh my god! I, I need to take a breath. <laughs> but the fact that he has David modify the antlers so that when they're placed upon her neck, they oh. actually go into her skin, so that he has control of all of her powers. That's some invasive. That's shit. like. That's it really is. You're right. Yeah. Not, I mean, like, but not only do I like own you now, I like own everything about you. I can even put things in you. Like I own your body. I can do things. Just it's just terrible. White male. Yeah, people, it's basically like, like like put it's it's like putting her on remote control. <laughs> it's worse. Than like it, like that's just that's worse, that's like worse the, than that. the entire worst. And the thing that gets me is there are still people who I ship mean, this he relationship. Literally, he literally what? But see, people who ship this relationship are the same people who ship Joker and Harley Quinn without fully understanding how toxic see, that relationship Joker, is. Joker, this well, is true. I was going to say Joker ain't never, yeah, but Joker did throw her You're in vat right. of acid, but, but that's neither here nor there. But he literally put things, something, but- a foreign object into her body against her will. It doesn't get worse than that. While smiling in her face and saying, baby, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then he goes over to touch her and shows, and she's trying to, she's like, this is my power. You can't have it. And, and she, I mean, she's still powerful, 
And she almost breaks free, but he was like, yeah, but now I control it. And I'm just like, <sighs> when I tell you, oh my God, this whole scene, this whole scene this made the off. entire series. Okay. It did. <laughs> it did. You knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, you're right. This is like, I'm looking at it now and it's just, oh my God, this is terrible. Like, I mean, she, she's trying to push, pull him off, and he's like, no, you're not doing that. Uh, and her face just goes weak, and and, you, and he's and the and the coin on the hand and the and you know and the poor little uh heart render, you know, he you know he doesn't really want to do it, but he has to. Yeah, David's face oh, yeah. tells just, everything. Oh, yeah, like I said, this just, oh, made the scene. But at mm -hmm. this point, it's like you've been doing what he wants this whole time. So now, I mean, yep. what else are you gonna do? I it's just, I tell you, that whole that was a, no, you're they right. filmed, oh. yeah, they filmed that exceptionally that well. And, and and Mark was watching a little bit. He was in and out the first time I watched it. He walked in. He goes, "What the hell?" He looked at. It, he goes, "You know what? I'm out." He goes, "I don't even want to know what happened." He walked right out of the room. He's like, I, I don't, don't even tell me. Don't, I don't even want to know. <laughs> but it was so God. And it's just the way that he is, even mm. from this point on, about Alina. You know, he at one point he goes into he goes into the tent where Mal is being held, and he talks to Mal, and he basically says the equivalent of, "Yeah, you can have her for now because at some point." You're gonna get old. You're gonna die. And guess what? I'm gonna. I'm still gonna be here for her. And she's gonna realize I'm the only person who's ever been her equal. And I'll get her anyway by default. And I was just like, so, so is she gonna be immortal? What? Too? Yes, the stag uh, does give her immortality as long as she's wearing the the bones. <laughs> she ain't. She ain't wearing as long as it's inside right, her. Right inside her. Right. Well, Ugh. yeah. As long, yeah, yeah. As long as not as wearing long, that. Ugh. You know that's gotta She's hurt. Long as Sorry. Disgusting. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> and I, I wonder if that visceral reaction is what, what the writers were looking it, for. It hundred percent was. It had to had to be. Had to be. Oh. I mean, and, and the fact that they take great pains later on to uh disguise it is just sickening. Because that, that's even worse. But uh I do have a point of 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 an order when we get to the next scene with the with the kids, because they do something very cute. Are you talking about Inej yes. and Kaz and their little conversation? Okay, so let me tell you, I was about to, I, I was about to reach through the screen and punch <laughs> Kaz in the throat because he's trying to be all hard and not reveal his feelings to Inej, and she's getting ready to leave because she doesn't want to go back to Ketterdam. She doesn't want to go back and be part of Menagerie. And when she gets ready to leave, she's, you know, Kaz is not saying anything to her, and she's like. Is that it? Is that all you have to say? He's like, there's nothing left to say. I was like, if you don't, I was, I was literally like bawling my fist up to the screen, getting ready to punch through and punch him in the throat. Like, dude, if you don't stop her right now, and then he tells her you were right. And you know, they, they have this little conversation and that's when he finally admits, okay, you know what? Sun Summoner, yeah, she's real. I know I've been saying a lot of shit. I've been talking a lot of this, but yeah, she's real. And he was like, I played it over and over in my head. None of that's a trick. Like, you saw what she was able to do. Why did it take you trying to convince us? Like, it was right there. There were no tricks. There were no, you know, special lights. There was no wind coming from somewhere. It was she's real <laughs> and then there's just like has brecker finally been leaves and saints and he was like no hardly i just said that alina starkoff is a grisha with the power to manipulate light like um i think that's what y'all call a saint in your time but he says no she's a girl with the gift not a savior of lore and then there's just like okay whatever Kaz, if not saints what do you believe in and he tells her i believe in myself and you and Jesper. And I think that's the thing that I, you know, like I said, that's one of the things I love about Kaz. 
And because he believes in his people, like his loyalty is to those three. And Inez even says, why? Because we flock to your bidding, like the animals of vengeance you named us after. And then he tells her, he was like, crows don't just remember the faces of the people who wronged them. They also remember those who were kind. They tell each other who to look after and who to watch out for. And he's like, no saint ever watched over me. Not like you have. And I was like, oh, that's cute. Oh, you see her face. Her face changes. And she's looking at him like, wait, what? Huh? I was like, oh, okay. That's probably about as close to a confession of affection yeah, that you're going to and, get and from Kaz Brecker. Yeah, take it and go. Yeah. Take it. And, and, yeah, right. yeah. Right. But she tells him, she's like, look, I can't go back to the menagerie. And he's like, you won't. I really believe that he's not going to let her go back to that. Who, I mean, not just because he probably has affection for her, but again, has is loyal to her and to Jesper. Those are the people he counts on. And those are the people that count on him. He's not going to send her back to do whatever it is that they have her doing in the menagerie. And we, we know what kind of place that is. It's a brothel. She's been there since she's a child. So there's no telling what kind of stuff she's had to endure over the last 10 or so years of her life, he's not about to send her back to that, especially not after she has had to kill not right. once, but twice to save her life. No, bro, you got a blood debt. Mm -mm. You well, well part, of the, part of the problem with, with him, and we didn't see it, but we're uh, hopefully we'll see it next season, is that in, in the book, he's basically even more of a country bumpkin than, than her and, and Jesper, because when he comes to the city, he is from this little itty bitty small area, and he had a little pamphlet of saints that he kept on him, and he kept going over and over because it gave him comfort. But when whatever happened, which I'm not going to get into, happens to him, he loses faith. So for him to admit that uh, Alina is a saint and that she has power is huge for him because he never would have admitted any other than a saint with his own eyes. Mm -hmm. yeah but then the next thing that we see them they are i guess they're trying to figure out a way to get back across <laughs> the fold and they're looking <laughs> they're looking and they see arkin's train and of course there's some guards they're looking at it and and they're talking it over kaz is like yeah uh while you were hugging the bait jesper i was memorizing Arkin's time is and he's like Milo his name was Milo and then Inez is like yeah I understand but Jess is right da 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 and Karen <laughs> looks like Jess like you gave him a new name I'm like are y'all really about to be petty right now y'all got more important things to deal with but um Cass says something weird he says trust me Arkin and I think alike and I'm like I don't know if that's a good thing or not because Arkin ended up getting killed because of the way he thought but right after he says this the train blows up and uh Inez was like too soon to appreciate the irony mm. I think because now they can't take it so they're pretty much stuck so th they're gonna have to figure out something but <sighs> I, I mean I okay so I gotta go back to this whole the whole Kerrigan thing and Alina because that poor girl she gets taken you know to his base camp Ivan is guarding her and she's just sitting in the coach just like she's holding herself like right around her neck like she can't believe that this thing is a part of her then she gets into the tent and who mm. is there this this whole and scene was so it. awkward for me. And like she, I was just like, oh god! Like it, it was awkward, and it was one of those scenes where you kind of want to be mad with Jenga, but at the same time, it's like, what's she gonna do? Understand why she does yeah. the things she did because, of course, when she comes in. Elena thinks that she's there to help, but she's like, look, I need to get the king a message about Kerrigan. And Jenya tells her, well, the king's been taken quite ill. His affliction is quite serious. The apparat's been ruling in his stead. That creepy guy is ruling in the king's stead. 
oh my god and then when she asks about the queen Virginia tells her she's confined to her quarters no one wants her exposed to the king's contagion and then Alina starts looking like oh hold up so and she's looking at Jenya's, um her robes because she doesn't just have on the healer robes that she used to have on. She's got on the red robes with the fur collar. And Alina says, you've been made Corporal Nick. I, I hate, I hate <laughs> And it goes back to episode <laughs> one where we talked about the right. during this yep. call it with his come mm-hmm. with his words. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I understand why they have those names because I mean, think about it. Technically speaking, they're mm-hmm. in Russia. So they're using terms that are natural to that region. It's going to sound foreign to us and it's going to sound weird to us because if you've ever listened to the Russian language, that language is a lot, it's more harsh than the English language is. And it just, it doesn't roll off our tongues like it does theirs like they can say it and it sounds natural and it sounds beautiful to me but for us trying to say it it just sounds weird but you know so basically Jenga has gotten a promotion and she has on the coat and you know this is where Lena starts thinking about what's going on she was like oh wait a minute so you said Kerrigan gifted you to the queen when you were 11 Hmm. So does that mean that, you know, and, and she's just looking at, of course, Jenny uh, starts looking uncomfortable and she's like, Oh, you were, you were a spy for him. And Jenny says, I tried so to, she gives him. like a mini he version said, of the no. villain um monologue where she's like, you know, I tried to tell you. And it's, it's not even that because Alina puts it together. She was like, Oh, you said, be careful of powerful men. You should have warned me to include devious women in that and she was like yeah the king's illness she said i'm sure you had right. the uh inclination and the proximity to make that happen because remember jenya uh kind of inferred that the king had been using her for his pleasures and his comforts and who knows he's probably been doing that since she was 11 too and then that's when alina just starts realizing everything she was like oh you never sent my letters off to mal and when Jenny is like, I had no choice. Alina's like, yeah, you did. You did. You chose to betray our uh, friendship. And, and Choosing Jenny friendship says, over survival was not a luxury I could afford. Like, yeah, she's yeah. basically trying to outline the fact that she didn't have a choice but to do exactly what Kerrigan could do. What Kerrigan told her to do. Yeah, she said I was a whipping girl for the queen and a Grisha without a oh, color. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, you, you can kind of be mad about it, but you can kind of understand her place too, especially considering, you know, sold to the queen at 11, probably been abused by the king for that same amount of time. Kierigan pretty much controls all the Grisha. I mean, he was the, and this is another thing that makes me not like him. He sold her to the queen. He was the one that got her for the queen. And it's just like, you you can't really be mad at her for doing what she needs to do to get herself out of the situation and to put herself in, you know, put herself in a better position to where she kind of has, I guess, a little bit more control over what happens in her life. And of course, she's a healer. She can, you know, maybe make the king sick and maybe make the yeah, queen she's not really whatever. A healer, though. Right. I can't say Taylor. I blame her. I'm Taylor. Well, yeah, she's a tailor. So, but yeah, I mean, she, she, she was she doing what she could do to get out of the situation that. That, that she was in because I'm sure things weren't always peach king for her right. being around the king, especially as a teenager. And, and you really, right. I mean, like you said, you you feel bad, but you understand why she did it. And anyone in that situation, whether it's you're morally right or morally wrong, you're going to try and get yourself out of it. So I can't really be mad mad at her. I can be upset with her. I can be upset with her not yeah. slipping old girl a note saying, hey, you might want to run, but I can't fault her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I think Elena kind of gets that too, because Elena says, um, she says, I know what it's like to be in a position of struggle. 
and and what you did was no excuse and then that's when Jenya starts telling her she was like you know I used to try to fight him off and it never worked out in my favor but to be in a position to bring a fight to him that he can't control all these years wanting my revenge she couldn't you know she couldn't let that go and I think Alina understands that because if you think about it, yes, both of them were in positions where they had to struggle and where they had to fight. But whereas Alina was free to fight on her own and to kind of live, you know, she didn't have the greatest life, but she did have some sort of control over her life to a point. Jenya never had that, you know, and now is this moment where she can actually do something. She's like, look, I'm able to put him into a position. I'm able to give him a fight that he can't fight off. You know, I'm doing something to him that he can't get rid of. I have my chance to get my revenge. Now he can suffer for what he did to me. She was like, I never expected it to come to this, but wouldn't you have done it if you were me? And Alina can't really answer the question. She's just like, You know, he deserves every bit of your vengeance, but Kerrigan does not deserve your loyalty. And I agree. Kerrigan was the one that sold you in the first place. But I get, I I have to say this too. Kerrigan is the one that's trying to fight for the betterment of all Grisha. So she's in, she's in an impossible position at this point. And, and Alina's trying, still trying to, you know, appeal to her. She's like, look, he's as much responsible for you being in this position as anybody else is. He doesn't deserve your loyalty and he's not loyal to you. We're his pawns. And of course, Jenny doesn't want to hear that. She walks out, but it's just kind of like, again, you don't, you can't be mad at her, but then at the same time, you still feel so bad for Alina because this is the one person in the castle that she thought was her friend that she thought she could trust. And turns out this is just somebody else who was in Kierigan's pocket who betrayed her. And it's just kind of like, I don't, I don't know. You just, I just. It's um, always awkward when you get to the point of the main hero getting betrayed by someone close to them. I mean, that's just like, that, that's the absolute worst it's like and when you when you see it and especially when it's when it's someone who you were looking you, you looked at him where you were like oh well she well she's definitely going to help her get out of this especially when you saw her apprehension to taking the scar off of her off of her palm that reminded her of mal so you were like so this this kind of i mean it's that makes it come out of left field even more And it makes that betrayal even more because it's like, now you know that Jenya was kind of manipulating that whole situation, making Alina feel that despair that, oh, Mal is not writing me back. I've been sending him all these letters and he's not writing me back. And now this is the time when I have to kind of, you know, let him go so that I can move forward. And she asked Jenya to remove that scar and Jenya removed that scar knowing what it was that brought her to that point and did it anyway because that was the goal that was what she was trying to accomplish for Kerrigan not you know doesn't matter that she knew how much that hurt Alina it was more so okay this is going to get me closer to my goal that part of the whole thing is really what makes me pissed off with with Jenny because it's like you knew what that meant to her and you put her in a, into a position where she thought that that was necessary anyway. Right. It's just like... <sighs> yeah, that whole scene uh, was just like heartbreaking and just hard to watch, like, at the same time. Yeah. But we go back to the crows and, of course, Kaz has found out that Kerrigan has Alina again and that he's planning on sailing back across the fold with her. And so his plan is to find a way to get aboard the ship so that they can go back across the phone. And I'm like, and Jesper and uh, Inez are also looking like, so you want to get on the same ship with all of the people that are hunting us down mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. we can go back across the fold. And at first they thought that, um, you know, they were like, okay, so is your plan to steal Alina again? 
or are you just going to let a, a million Kruger go? And I think at this point, Kaz is like, look, we don't, we don't have the numbers. We don't have the energy. We can't win this fight. So at this point, he's just like, look, we just need to get on the ship, get back across the fold, and then just kind of disperse. He tells Amesh, when we mm -hmm. land in Nova Kribis, you can go do whatever you want because he's like, you can't go back to the menagerie and she doesn't want to go back to the menagerie. So now they just got to figure out how to get on the ship. And in the meantime, this is where, like I said, Kerrigan goes to see Mal and he has this conversation. And I was just, I was almost like, I want Mal to be able to break out of this chain and just like, I, I just want to see them get into like a full on fist fight. But this whole Kerrigan thing, because because Mal is, I'm, uh, again, I'm telling you, Mal is that ride or die. He's like, look, I'm going to hunt you down. If you keep me alive, if you don't kill me, I am going to hunt you down. I am going to kill you. And Kerrigan, the way he talks to Mal, he's just so, I guess this is where uh, Lori's Romeo pimp description comes in. And he's like, you know, yeah, you have strong feelings for her. She has strong feelings for you. He was like, but all these years, you never truly appreciated who she is. And he was like, it, it's all right, because I do. No, I, you know what? I totally, totally, totally disagree with that whole statement. You don't appreciate her. You appreciate what she can do. That's the difference. Everybody, keep, and I've seen, I've seen other people say this too, about Mal never really paid attention to Alina, who she was. Yes, he did. He just didn't say anything because in his mind, she was too good for him and he didn't want to mess that friendship up. That happens all the time. That doesn't mean that, oh, she was invisible to him. No, have you have you guys seen the way Mal looks at her, the way Mal talks to her? Even in the first episode, it was like, oh yeah, dude, you are so in love with her. But everybody keeps saying, oh, you didn't appreciate her. You didn't pay attention to her. Why? Just because he wasn't fawning all over her? because he wasn't trying to get into her pants. That's the thing that makes me mad about all of this because everybody is equating the fact that they're not together. He hasn't declared his feelings for her as him ignoring her or not appreciating her or her being invisible. And it's like, no, if you look at his body language, that's totally not the case. I don't know. Everybody always wants to equate this whole sex equals love thing. And I'm just like- Plus we have to remember no. that this is a young adult novel that they transcribed. So- there's not going to be a lot of sex in this. So it's like, there's going to be a lot of defining feelings and kissing and hugging and- A lot of coming of age stuff. Exactly. This, of, is, this, is, right. this isn't this is like, you know, he puts her hand on her supple breast and she heaves a breath and all this other shit. There's not going to be none of that shit. Nah, right. this, is, this, is, this is like <laughs> subtle, subtle undercover shit. This is not going to be like overt, like, you know, we doing it shit. So- Right. But the thing that really gets me in this conversation is that when Kerrigan is telling Mal, he's like, she chose me. You're just a child. Even if you take away my shadows, I still have something that you don't, which is patience. He was like, Alina may take years to forgive me, but I got all the time in the world. You can have her. Y'all can live a nice, happy life. And then you will die and she will still be around. And guess what? So will I. First of all, she only chose you because you manipulated the situation. Do y'all really honestly think that Alina would have approached him, kissed him, if she didn't think that Mal had abandoned her? Oh. No, no way in hell. He manipulated the situation. Jenga manipulated the situation. If her letters had gotten to Mal, if his letters had gotten to her, if she had known that he was looking for her, that he was fighting to get to her, whatever, there is no way in hell Kerrigan would have had a chance, period. He's charming, but he ain't that charming because there's always something sinister. It's his eyes. It's, the, the it's those cold black ass eyes that he has. Man. And the fact that he's just sitting here like, yeah, she chose me. She didn't want you. Dude. Wait, get up out of here with that. Man. <laughs> like, like, and here's the thing, like you keep saying, okay, yeah, she can be happy with you. Y'all could be together for 50, whatever years. And then after you're gone, she's going to look to me and she's going to come to me because I'm her equal. Dude, 
you're talking about getting her on a rebound. Right. Like that's supposed to be the big thing. That's supposed to, that's the thing that you're like bragging about that. Oh yeah, she'll choose you and she's going to be with you. But then when you're gone, she's going to come to me anyway. Get some self-respect about yourself. Like you want to, you want to be the guy that she wants to be with because she doesn't have no other choice. You really want to be that guy. That's basically, that's exactly what he said. It's like, you know, I mean, eventually, yeah, yeah, she'll, you'll have her for a minute, but you know, eventually she's going to realize that I'm the only one that's going to be here with us. So, yeah. And the funny thing is, the way that Ben Barnes delivers these lines is kind of like, he makes it sound so desirable. Like, he makes it sound so good. Like, yeah, this is what's going to happen and da-da-da-da-da. And you can see Mal sitting there listening to it and it's just kind of like, but dude, listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's really saying. She will choose you. And then after you're gone, then she's going to go to him. Like, all I heard was what, instinct in the background the saying, it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and then, I mean, just, just think of the fact that if Mal turns out to be a Grisha and he, and he can figure out a way to live longer, then he's going to be like, Yo, you're out of luck now, buddy. Guess what? Well, I mean, what is it that he tells Kerrigan? He said, you'll this wish you true. killed me here. So we get into the next part, going back to the crows. Of course, you know, they've already hatched their plan as far as how they're going to get on the ship. And they have to, um, they're, they're, they're basically what they're doing is they're robbing some of the people who attended the Winter Fed so that they can get clothes to make them look like distinguished people and they can steal some IDs so that they can get on the ship. And then we see Jesper in his little outfit. And I was like, okay, y'all, you know what? Jesper and his sense of style, this little red suit that he has on, he's like, he's looking at himself in the mirror and then she's like, you look fine. He was like, I know I No, do. no. He says, I, I look I fantastic. That's what he says. Yes, he looks fantastic. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do, Jesper. But... And then the funny thing is that when they, when they go through the ID, he looks at the age of the person who he's supposed to be imitating. He's like, no one's ever going to believe I'm that old. And then what happens when they try mm. to get on the ship? <laughs> they, actually, they actually believe it's him. They're like, oh, okay. He's like, his feelings all hurt. But um, the other funny part about this is, so we go back to Mal in the tent. And of course, he's trying to get away he's trying to figure out a way to break out of the handcuffs and the guard has fallen asleep and who walks into the tent but milo the goat with that bullet around <laughs> his neck best I like, scene ever i was like man i was like how in the world did milo just happen to end up in the right best place NPC at the right ever. time is milo part part of the crows now like is, is he like the sixth member of the crows no, no, but he should be because, like I said, you know, he is the best NPC ever. So, and it's so funny because Mal sees the bullet, so he lures uh Milo over to him. He gets the bullet, and then he kisses Milo. He's like, he's like, oh, thank you. Oh, you smell. I'm what like, did he expect? No, don't, don't go. kiss goats. I, Stop that. It's okay. Ew. Uh, okay, for those of us who grew up with farm animals as part of our daily lives. <laughs> that will make one of you. Look, I grew up with a rooster in the backyard. Okay? That rooster stank. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, yeah, they usually The do only song sings nice. like that when I went to Roanoke, Alabama to visit my relatives there. That's the only time I ever saw <laughs> I keep forgetting you have relatives from Ronald. Exactly. because that's where my dad is from. Yeah, exactly. That's funny. We'll talk about that. We'll talk well, about in, that. in Illinois, but, it is common in town because there's because remember where I'm from, you live either in town or not. It was common in town to have a couple of pigs, a cow, and a, a rooster and chickens. And we had a rooster and chickens, and we lived in town. Yeah, we. I, I see a little bit of that where I am I, now. I don't know what to do with that. Go down the street, and you might see. Um, some roosters and I think my ex-husband in, in the backyard of his house the house that was behind him they had animals and I remember going to drop off my son or pick up my son and I pulled up and I was like 
do you have he was like yeah my neighbors have pretty much a mini farm in the back i'm like is that a goat he was like yep there's actually two back there i was like okay in the middle of clayton county <laughs> all right then but but yeah so milo the goat he comes in has his bullet mal takes the bullet he puts it in the cuffs of his uh you know he puts it in the hole of his handcuffs and then he um I don't even remember what it was he grabbed, but he hits the bullet and of course it knocks the handcuff loose. But the funny way that he did it, he did it and then of course he had to pretend like he was asleep because it was gonna wake the guard up. The way that he just kind of fell back and just kind of like, oh, and the guard mm -hmm. just wakes up like, what's going on? Oh, okay. Hmm. Yes, the guard here, the guard hears okay, a bullet go off and just kind of nonchalantly glances at Mal and doesn't realize <laughs> He was asleep. He heard a bullet. He, he heard a, a gunshot, basically. And look and looked at Mal was like, oh, well, okay, he's still there, so I'm just gonna go back to sleep. He was asleep. Nobody else was running in to find out what was going on. And the guard was asleep. He could have been dreaming that. Dreaming a gun. <laughs> he doesn't live in Clayton County. He ain't dreaming no damn gunshots. Well, say he doesn't live near Oakland either. Jeez. He doesn't live in, in insert saying. gunshot filled county here. Yes, it's like he still didn't think that was okay. That's fine. And we, let's just yeah, fine. What? My only thing is is that uh, shout out to to the casting because Milo got to be in two big episodes. Milo the goat, and, and I love it because he actually bridges the two groups together by that one scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. That's a hell of a yeah. casting call. It's like you have ghost walking like. You know what? I don't like your face, and I like you, but I don't think you're like the bridging the gap kind of goat. So I think we're gonna go with this one. Well, it's 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 actually funny. <laughs> yeah, but um, next scene is Kerrigan and Elena, and I I gotta tell y'all, I was watching this scene, and I was just. You know how, like, I have this thing when I'm really, really mad, mm -hmm. I squeeze my hands because I'm trying to keep, because other than that, I have, I have my hands and fists and I dig my fingernails into my palms. And so I'm sitting there squeezing my hand because I'm like, this dude here, like Alina looks really pretty, but she's got these damn antlers sticking out of her, her chest. And he comes in, he's like, you are special. You know that, right? You're about to prove it to the world. And she is looking at him with all this disgust. This is the pimp scene right like, here. He's like, mm -hmm. I did it for us, baby. This is for you and me, baby. We're going to be together. We're going to be strong together, baby. If books Facts. could kill, Kerrigan would be mm -hmm. ash in the seat. Because Alina is like, you lied to me about the black heretic talking about the sins of your father there is no father that was you she says so that means you killed my friends you killed my parents and you could see it's like when you think about it you see kerrigan while she's saying all of this to him and it's kind of like he's looking like oh shit yeah i did mm -hmm. like he didn't think about but he's the so that old though that he you know he and stuff like that doesn't just come to his mind you know yeah right right exactly it's kind of like he's detached from it but now you have someone sitting in front of you who has been personally affected by it like it literally shaped her whole life mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. losing her parents in the fold and she's like and now your perversion of power extends to me and then he tries to yeah. call bagra a liar how can you believe the words of that twisted old angry woman excuse you you know he's he's so and then he tries to tell she's like look you've been lying to me since the day we met he was like telling you half a story is not the same as lying mm -hmm. i mean yeah that's Dude, that's that's that's, lie, that's, that's the lie. definition of a lie the entire definition and i mean she you know what she calls him on everything she's like okay so what about using the apparat to usurp the king so that you can have the throne and he's just sitting there looking like damn she know all my business and he he's still like i would have thought you would have understood you know to live in hiding all our lives you know that's everything that i've ever done was always for the grisha that's why i built the little palace so that we could be safe i just wanted to make rafka safer to make grisha safer 
And then she says, did you think Jenya was safer when you placed her under the king's watch? And am I to believe that you would show bag with mercy? Like when she said that, I was like, oh, wait, he probably really would kill his mother at this choice. I mean, he he threatened as much yeah. in the last episode, didn't he? Say, you are not even that important to me anymore. You are not even important anymore, whatever. But I tell you, this guy's a piece of work. He looks good in black, but he he is a piece of work. But I mean, he does tell her, he was like, I never meant for the fold to become what it was. I never meant for the king or for General Zlatan to use it for what it has. But she was like, but you meant to put this collar on me. You did that on purpose. You lied to me. You manipulated me. And he's still sitting there like trying to appeal to her. Oh, he just, mm-hmm. oh, he makes me sick. He makes me sick. And then she tells him, she was like, we could have had this. Like, this could have been us genuinely. You could have made me your equal and we would have been good. But uh, again, I, you know. Mm. Yeah. That's just, you know, and then she's like, you could have made me your equal, but instead you made me this. And she's holding Like, she get, grabs his hand and puts it on there, like, to it. reinforce the point. Like, she was like, you did this. And like, you know, I understand what she mm-hmm. did, but it's like she he's not going to regret that because his whole point of this, which is getting ready to be revealed, is for power. So it's like, I mean, you he's like, she's like, you did this to me. He's like, Yeah, I did, but I don't regret it because I have I have a purpose for this. So I mean, yeah, I did it. So what? And then All he right. got to learn to have an attitude. Fine, make me your villain. Excuse me, you did that. She just has to accept that she has a glorious purpose. Glorious purpose. (laughs) I'm I'm more impressed that the girl hasn't passed out due to the pain of having oh I don't know antlers in her neck. I mean, probably don't hurt now. I mean, they're they're probably just oh come on, you see? Do you see the gaping hole in her collarbone, like right here? It's the skin hasn't even healed over it. Okay, that's gotta hurt. It's just, it's it's disgusting. I mean, it looks, I mean, but I'm sure that what's his name probably did something where it wouldn't be that uncomfortable for, like, for Ginya, because, you know, him and Ginya have a thing. So Ginya probably was probably like, try to make it, try to make it so that it's not painful or uncomfortable for her. So she can at least, you know, not, not be uncomfortable when this happens. But it's like, okay, so what, so how does, how does she sleep? So when does, so when infection infection sets in, what is she supposed to do? I mean, you're right, Anthony, how she sleep? I ordered that too. Better yet, how do you get your clothes on and off? I mean, seriously, one, one good twist and turn at night and she's going to poke her eye out. I mean, come on. Ow. I kind of feel like even though, yes, there could be measures taken so that she's not uncomfortable, I kind of feel like Elena would be the type of person to refuse that because she wants to feel all of that so that she can continue to be angry about it. So that every time that she feels it, she's reminded of the betrayal. Okay, okay, Hanukkah. Hanukkah. I see your point, but Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now, I would take some fucking aspirin. I'm sorry, okay? I can be reminded of what he did me wrong and have aspirin at the same time, okay? (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Aspirin, ibuprofen, alcohol, cotton swab, something. You do not forget that (laughs) pain. It's like she just get, she, oh, maybe, maybe she yeah. just get marshmallows and put them on the points so that she doesn't. Oh, stop, 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 <laughs> stop. No way. That's just wrong. <laughs> Molding clay. I don't know. <laughs> but here he goes lying to her again because they're walking to the ship. And before she joins him, Ivan comes up to him and tells him uh, that Mal has escaped. Like he escaped sometime during the night. I have a team looking for him. And, you know, Kerrigan is like, okay, good, whatever. At least I don't have to worry about him. But if he goes n- near Miss Starkoff, put him down. And then as they're walking towards the ship, he tells Alina that Mal is being kept under guard in the camp. Do as I say, and I'll release him. You lying. Like you literally just left her tent. Getting mad because she accused you of Look, being he is a, so a close to achieving his end game that he doesn't care. It's like as long as little motherfucker doesn't interfere with what I'm trying to do, 
let him go. I don't give a fuck. Because like he said before, he's going to outlive him. And it doesn't, I mean, he, he, he's, he's a pity. He's like a flea, basically, to him. If it doesn't bother him, it's fine. But if he comes next to him, he's going to swat him. So it's like he doesn't give, he doesn't give a fuck about Mal. Like, fuck Mal. But that's, but that's the mistake that they always do. That's a trope. Let, yes, yes, that's the that's trope. trope. Especially with this one. It is. But especially with this one, I mean, like, like has nope. Kerrigan not been paying attention? Apparently not. Does he really think that Mal is going to escape and just let Alina be taken wherever it is that right. she's being taken? As soon as they told him <laughs> Mal's escape, he shouldn't be like, hey, y'all need to find that dude. <laughs> yeah, true. Right. Yeah, because he's right. like the cockroach of the story. It's like, you can't kill him. It's like, you can hurt him, you can take a leg off, but he's still going to be crawling around and fucking your shit up. And, and the thing is, Kerrigan should understand, like, he needs to stop underestimating Mal. Yes, you're Grisha, but guess what? Mal as a human has proved to be a very huge thorn in your side. Stop underestimating this dude. And then he does the same. They get on the ship and he has Alina chained to the deck of the ship. And of course her dress is kind of covering the chain. And she says, this isn't a good look for you. Everyone will see that I'm your prisoner. He says, I doubt very much that they'll notice your feet. And he takes off the cloak so that her gown and her collar are exposed. For everybody like, to see. You, you, oh. And of course, Mal has found his way on the ship, <laughs> which we knew he would. He's not going to let well, Alina just go. Guy. Yep. And then Kaz and Inej and Jesper are also on the ship, along with all of these high paying, high class, whatever. And they're all looking at the fold and everybody looks terrified, but you know, I guess y'all want to see the sun summoner that bad. Y'all want to have a front row seat to the destruction of the fold that you are willing to risk Volcra and whatever else. Mm, okay. I guess that's what y'all do with your money. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then of but, course the, the kids, you know, they do the famous line, no mourners, no funerals, you know. Yeah, because Jesper says, if I die and you two survive, make no, sure you I... Want to you to open no casket open because I look fantastic. Oh, no. Right. Yeah, make yeah. sure I have an open, open casket. And that's I mean, no he, he did look good in that suit. I got I got to give him to him. That 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 little plaid suit was was fire. I, yeah. That was that was dope. My yeah. boy looks so good. He looks so good. But after that, they disappear into the fold and... Now we've got one episode Ooh. left for season. But oh, oh, when I tell you, oh, Kerrigan made me so mad in this, this episode. And it's like, even now, there are still people, even based on this first season, who are shipping Kerrigan. And see, I don't get that. Like, I don't, I, you know what? Now? I don't get that. The book that I'm reading is with the kids, Six of Crows. I haven't got to the first, because Six of Crows takes place much later. So I, I only have read the synopsis of book one, and even for the synopsis and, and poking my nose around, I don't get it either. I honestly do not get it at all. I mean, I'm like, why? I mean, it's just... I mean, I get it. I, I get it at first because, of course, infamously... I was the one that shipped them after like the first three or four episodes. I shipped them together and everybody in this podcast laughed at me because they had already seen the other episodes and I wasn't privy to Kerrigan's deceit in the coming episodes. So I understand why you would say that because they, they would be literally and figuratively the perfect power couple, but it's like mm -hmm. Kerrigan is just way too toxic to be in a relationship with anybody and have them consider it a good relationship. Like he's just, he's way too power hungry and toxic for anything to be considered good. I mean, this is quite possibly a worse pairing relationship than Joker and Harley Quinn, potentially. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I, I can give you that. I just, it, it, it worries me that there are people who ship this and don't have a problem. I mean, I don't get it. But, you know, but at the same time, I also don't, I mean, I've seen things in life and I've seen people 
go back to people they shouldn't go back to and stuff like that. And it's like, you, you can, you never really can know what's going on in their head. So, yeah, you know, but I, I have to say, as far as the penultimate episode, this was pretty good. And for once, unlike a lot of penultimate episodes, they actually ended it on a really good breaking point. They really did because sometimes they take it a little too much. Sometimes they don't do quite enough. So it's a little uneven when you start the finale episode of season slash series or whatever. But this one, perfect. It, right as they're leaving off, they don't show anything further. They don't go show anything back. It, it's perfect stopping point. And the other thing is, we've got all one of team. our major yeah, players right. all yep. in one yep. in one place, which is going to make it really interesting because you've got the crows. You've got Kerrigan and the Grisha. You've got Alina. You've got Mal. All the major components are there. And not only that, they're all in the fold at this point. So you know the last episode is some shit about to go down. Mm -hmm. You know it. Yeah, It's getting ready to go down. Uh, Lord have mercy. I know. I mean... I'm just Yo, I mean, shout, shout out to the stag for getting a bum deal out of this. It's like, Alina could have gotten the power and gotten powered up from him still being alive, and he still ended up getting his head cut off by Kerrigan. And, you know, somewhere somewhere along the line, we're going to have to talk about Kerrigan's obsession with cutting people's heads off. Like, I mean, this is, like, kind of disturbing. Like, you know. I guess that's Kerrigan's version of a double tap. Right. Like, I can imagine Kerrigan as a child taking doll heads off. You know? Like, if there were Barbies that existed back then, he probably would have been taking Barbie heads off and, like, throwing them throwing them around and shit. I don't think he did that as a kid. I think all of this really happened, like, a as we saw at the beginning of this episode. It's just basically, he got pushed too far. Like, once they start, he probably, you know what? I will say this. If the king hadn't started hunting down Grisha and killing them, trying to eliminate them, Kerrigan probably wouldn't have turned out the way that he had. Definitely I, not. I will Definitely say that not. much. Yeah. But on the other hand, while we're sitting here joking about the fact that Kerrigan likes to make sure that everyone's dead by cutting their heads off, I find it very funny that right now Mal pretty much is the reason that all the stuff that he wants to happen isn't happening yet he hasn't taken well, I don't think he can see I don't but. think that he's even considered doing something that drastic because he doesn't think that Mal is worth the time and energy and effort hey. and I understand that but if you think about it neither were those other people that he killed those were just basic men they were just in his way Mal literally like Mal is the reason why Alina yeah, is not yeah. with him Mal has kind of messed up his plans every which way he turns you know and yeah he gives this brave speech about yeah you know what you can have her but in the end she's gonna be with me anyway because we have all the time in the world blah 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 but I feel like that's a little bit of a front like you can't let this do or you can't let this girl see how much it hurts that she would rather be with Mal than him I'm your equal. We could rule the world together. Why don't you want to be with me? Why are you still stuck on him? Even after everything that he has done to try to, you know, pull her away from Mal and his, I, you know, I don't want to say influence because I don't think there is really any influence like that, but it's just, I, I don't know. I just find it very odd that Kirigan has not done that to Mal when he's done that to other people who have gotten in his way. But I I, I kind of sort of feel like he's probably scared of Belina in that sense. Like, think about what he did when they killed the woman that he loved and came after him. Think about how powerful he was. He was so mad that he created the fold. If he does the same mm -hmm. thing to Alina, she probably would be way more powerful than he ever could be. And I yeah, think he's I scared that. of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. One episode left. Yay! And then we get a whole Huzzah. second season. Yay. But we have to wait until next mm -hmm. year. 
which, you know, I love renewals and I know that, you know, shows have to take time to film and edit and all this other stuff, but golly, the hiatuses are so frustrating because I'm like, I want it now. I want to see what's going to happen in the second season. I want to see what's going to happen. I don't right. want to wait see, till next this, year. This, this is my thing. Uh, we talked about this earlier, and I'm going to talk about a few things, but I'm not going to spoil, spoil. But I will say this. Considering how episode eight ends, I'm hoping that something that happens in the books actually happens in the second season, because that would be awesome to see what they do in a different uh, setting. Um. I, I'm really okay. loving this show as far as the characters, but I think what I love even more is the fact that they combined two books and they were so seamless together that it's like, I'm sort of mad at the author because I'm like, well, why didn't you just do this as one book? Right. Well, I mean, if you think about it, she probably she wrote Shadow and Bone first yeah. and then had the idea yeah. to do Six of Crows and then, you know, probably in her mind at the time that she wrote the book maybe the crows right, didn't right because king of scars is, is a characters. book that comes later after both of those and king of scars she actually kind of does a little play on a few characters zoya uh meeting up with some of the people and they do a whole bunch of different things and it's sort of a she said she wished that she would have incorporated a little bit more or less because of the reception yeah yeah, but yep. that's okay. We have the show, and she's a, yes. I believe she's yep. an executive yep. producer on the show, and she does consult, she does give some input. So, I mean, hey, if she decides to write more books and, and kind of incorporate the characters together, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious because, like I said, because they added the two books together, I and I'm going to read the first book. I've heard that the first book is good, but it's sort of thin if I could use that term, versus versus uh, Six okay. of Crows, which has more meat in it. So uh, it's almost as if they had to add the books together to make a four more fleshed out uh, storyline. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Any final thoughts on episode seven of Shadow? I'm hoping we're going to get more, um, more backstory on Alexander's family. You think we're gonna get that in the next episode, or you are? Is that something that this you is what I want overall in the series? In the series. Okay, okay. Because I was gonna say I don't think they would have time to put that in next episode yeah, well. since that's the last one. But yeah, that would be good. I, I want to find out more about that, and then just I want to see more with his relationship with Bagra, because, like I said, that dyna- that mother son dynamic is so interesting to me with them because one minute they're relating like mother and son and then the next minute they're relating like two people who really can't stand each other and it's just kind of fascinating to watch because they're literally doing this in the same breath it's like oh mother oh son oh you know what you were supposed to do this and it's your fault that this and blah 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 well you aren't important anyway it's just kind of like what what are these even the same two characters having the same conversation it's their their dynamic is very interesting, so I would love to see a little bit more. Yeah, of I that. think that um, the one thing we haven't seen in this episode is the healer and the is, is um what's her name, um the one Nina that was on the show. Yes. Yeah, it'll be interesting Nina to see what happens highest. with them coming up because I mean the, that that's still that's still kind of an open yeah. open ended kind of thing that they left that they didn't address in this episode. So that'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. Oh yeah, I'm sh- I'm sure we we definitely will be seeing them in the next episode. They can't just leave us hanging with those two, especially after that last episode. Like, okay, so now we're getting to where they are admittedly liking each other. We yep. need more of that in our lives. That's a, I mean, that's I that's a lot of sexual tension to be left hanging. I mean, it's like a lot. Right. For a whole year. Yeah, right. you got to give us something in the next yeah. episode. You I have mean, to. and I have to be honest, I didn't think that I would be as into this series as I was, but I'm like really invested into it now. Like, I love the crows. I think the weird thing is, I'm more invested in the crows 
story than I am with Alina being the Sun Summoner. Like, I really, I think I said Citizen in an episode we did before, but I'm really invested in their interactions and how they how they are. Like, I really love those characters, especially Kaz. Like, between Kaz and Jesper, those are probably my two favorite characters in this. With, um... Not Inez? Uh, okay. Look, man, and your wife's still sitting over there. Don't be get, don't be trying to get me in all kinds of shit. What the hell's wrong with you? We are. I think Inej is a given. Thank you, so honey. But didn't get me out of trouble and shit. Like, what the fuck? Didn't. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm 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 really interested, especially in the next season. I'm really interested in the seeing seeing how they develop the crows because they I, I just find them really interesting. I I think that. Uh, a lot of the story that we might get with the crows might be a lot of stuff that are left unanswered, like Pekka. Uh, they kind of brought Pekka in at the beginning, and then they mentioned him a little bit, and then they drop it. So I'm curious to see what part Pekka Rawlings is going to be playing into the crows. Uh, I've mentioned briefly that uh, that uh, there's a little gambling problem with Jesper that uh, may or may not have some issues with him down the line. And then with uh, uh, Inej, there's the fact that she basically was kidnapped as a child and forced to work in the menagerie. What, what about her feelings about her family that she has ne- not seen or can't find? Or how's that going to play out? So you've got three very good, strong uh, things that you can lead into season two with just the three of them with the crows. And I agree, they are my favorites. And I like Zoya too. Yeah. I think Zoya had a, a pretty good uh, run this season. I wish y'all listening could see my face about Zoya. I just, I, just I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if she if she gets like another arc, kind of as far as how she is. But I just, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm with Hanako. Dude. I just, she's she's shady as fuck, and I just don't trust her. Yeah, but I think, um, do we know? If Zoya, well, I, you know what? I would assume Zoya is also on the ship because it seems like Kirigan brought all his important people. So I'm just ready to see what's going to happen with this final episode. But for now, that is it for our show. You can find us online at www.fandomhybrid.com. We are on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Phantom Hybrid. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and other major podcast streaming platforms. Thanks for listening. We hope you join the conversation next time. 